You know, I want to switch us over to another uh, subject that uh, is making the headlines heavily, and it's AI. Um, how do you feel about AI safety? Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts? Are you concerned about the speed at which AI is progressing? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not uniquely concerned about AI relative to any other highly powerful bit of technology, science, engineering that we have brought upon ourselves in the history of civilization. So, no, I'm not uniquely worried. I think there should be constraints, yes. There should be, but the constraints need to be established by people who know what they're constraining. It can't just be some members of Congress who read a few headlines and now they want to pass legislation based on a fear factor. It has to be intelligently reasoned, debated, of course. Uh, and by the way, you need politicians in that debate because politicians are our collective representatives. And so they carry some of the fears or the joys of the citizenry. So, but you would have this conversation to find out what would be taking AI too far. And let's put constraints, make that illegal to take it too far. What would be just right? And then you have examples of what would be just right. So this week, and California legislature approves a bill with sweeping AI. Uh, restrictions. I, I find, you know, listen, safety standards requiring large scale AI companies to undergo safety testing before deployment. Fantastic. In fact, OpenAI and Anthropic uh, have volunteered to do this. Transparency, great. But this is interesting. Worker protections, um, protecting workers and call centers from being replaced by AI. Well, that would be ripe for Republicans to argue against. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, that's, like a, that's, that's like raw meat for a Republican. Um, I, I, that I think is naive. Yes. That would be like passing a law saying we have to protect all auto workers from these bots that are now assembling our cars. That, you know, if, had you done that, then we would have trailed the world in an entire industry and the industry would have gone out of business. So there's certain, so that looks a little naive to me. And, uh, so, oh, by the way, we, you and I are old enough to remember that when cars were made by humans, there was a very real chance that in the morning your car wouldn't start. <laughs> okay. I was, I was showing a movie to my son from the movie was from like the seventies and the, 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 the bad guys are, are running to get away and they get in the car and they try to start the car and it doesn't turn over. And my son said, didn't they have gas in the car? <laughs> it's not, he can't think that why would a car not start? Of course it's <laughs> going to start. It's a machine that works perfectly, right? So cars are lighter, faster, better, more fuel efficient than they've ever been, and they're all made by robots. So, so we have to, one has to think about, if, if you want to be proactive about it, what you should say is, what new job opportunities will AI bring to us? Rather than complain about what jobs it replaces just to keep that in mind. And by the way, Hollywood went through this brilliantly. Okay, the, the strikes that happened, was it a year ago, just coming yeah. out of COVID, what part of those, those arguments, and I'm a member of SAG-AFTRA, the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Radio and Television Artists. Mm. The, the two unions had joined together because I've had some cameos, not that I'm a big time actor, of course I'm not, that I don't know how to act. But I can be myself as a cameo in a tiny role, <laughs> as I have been in a few movies. But uh, one of their concerns was they don't want a movie studio that has access to your, your video record to now recreate your character and your voice for a role that you don't even have to show up for. And even more so than that is the concern. Let's say I have 20 seasons of Law and Order, right? And I have staff writers that wrote them all. I, in, I get an AI bot to ingest all 20 seasons and I say, write me 20 more seasons mm -hmm. on this topic, that topic, that topic in the style that these previous 20 had been written. Well, that's clearly intellectual property theft at that level. And so this all had to be hammered out and it was. So now, yeah. let, me, I, let me ask you, because this is interesting, right? The disruption of the hegemony of Hollywood is, is coming because we're not far if we're not there already from the studio saying, I'm going to create my own stars and starlets um, and we're going to own them and they're going to be fully digital. 
uh, and we're going to make our movies based on them. We're going to we're going to create Wait, celebrities. That what cartoons are that, that's what cartoons are. But when, so when, when they say. become when they become lifelike, or we're going to bring back Marilyn Wait, Monroe. Those are animated cartoons. Brown. They're animated movies. Disney created The Lion King. So what's your point? Somebody gets somebody gets money for the voice. Okay, of course that was James Earl Jones. Okay, <laughs> as as Mufasa, but. The character, the, Disney owns the characters. So what's different to you about this? Only that they are photorealistic human characters that uh, would uh, obviate the need for actors at some point in the future. Okay, so I wonder if, uh, no, that's an interesting future. Uh, I wonder if they would ever become as popular as real human being actors, wh where the press, you know, where TMZ follows them when they come out of the restaurant or when, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're not an actual living thing, is the lifestyles of the rich and famous? Will that, will anyone have any interest at all? I, I bet not.